One of the most difficult components for first time builders to choose is their power supply. Power supplies won't improve your frame rate and they don't make your system look cool. Although there are some RGB power supplies out there now if you're into that kind of thing. However, there is no component more central to your system's long-term health than your power supply. If you choose a low quality power supply, your system's performance could be limited or worse, you could run the risk of damaging your components. On the other hand, if you don't understand how much power you need in order to efficiently power your system, you could end up allocating more of your budget towards your power supply than is necessary. In this video, we're going to go over a number of different factors that you should consider before you choose a power supply. Understanding these points will help you pick the right power supply for your needs and budget. Then, as we are working with a $1,000 budget for our gaming PC build, we'll walk you through our thought process in choosing a power supply for our build. We'll start off by talking about power supply form factor. Power supplies come in a few different standard sizes. The majority of system builders will use a standard ATX power supply. However, if you're looking to build a mini system, you may need to use a small form factor power supply. The form factor you need will be determined by your case. Choosing the right form factor power supply is as simple as checking the spec sheet of the case you want to use to see what form factors it supports. Then you'll just need to check what form factor the power supply you are considering is, which will either be listed in the PSU's listing on a retailer's website or on the manufacturer's product page. Before you choose a power supply, you need to first figure out how much power you will actually need in order to run your computer. You can do this a few different ways. First, you could find power draw benchmarks on the components in your system, mainly your GPU and CPU, and add them together to give you a minimum wattage rating, and then you would add some headroom to that number, around 100 to 200 watts, depending on your use case, in order to ensure that you have enough power to accommodate your system. Or you can use a power supply calculator like the one available from Outer Vision that will do all of this for you. Finally, you could just use the recommended minimum PSU wattage from your graphics card manufacturer or from the graphics card brand. Where a calculator will give you a more accurate estimate of how much power your system will actually require, the manufacturer's recommendation on your graphics card will likely overestimate that amount. But since it's a good idea to add some headroom anyways, using the manufacturer's recommendation for your graphics card is usually a safe way to go. A lot of no-name PSU manufacturers list their power supplies at wattage ratings that are much higher than what they can actually deliver over a given period of time. Some first-time PC builders make the mistake of thinking that just because a power supply has a high wattage rating, that means it is a good enough power supply for their needs. And because a lot of these low-quality power supplies come in at low prices, some make the mistake of thinking they are getting a solid power supply for a great price. The reality though is that they are probably purchasing a subpar unit that has a misleading wattage rating. So it's important to avoid low-end power supply manufacturers and just stick to well-known manufacturers. Here's a quick list of manufacturers who are known for delivering quality power supplies. Superflower, EVGA, Corsair, Seasonic, Antec, Cooler Master, Silverstone, Thermaltake, and Be Quiet. This of course is not an end-all list and it's very important to note that not every power supply from the manufacturers we just mentioned are quality units. In fact, some of these manufacturers have been known to produce some not so great power supplies. So it's essential that once you know how much wattage you need that you do your due diligence in researching what quality units are available in your price range. The best way to do that is to read expert reviews on the units you are considering. Testing a power supply is a bit more involved of a process as compared to testing or benchmarking other components. In the description below, we've linked to the PSU testing methodologies from a site like Tom's Hardware. A lot of extra equipment is used in the power supply tests, and some of that equipment is fairly expensive. And because the process of testing power supplies is a bit more difficult than testing other components, there aren't as many thorough power supply reviews out there as there are with other components. Fortunately, there are a handful of reputable power supply reviewers out there. There's Tom's Hardware, Tech Power Up, and Hardware Busters all offer in-depth and detailed power supply reviews, to name a couple. Before you purchase a power supply, it's a good idea to check and see if any of these websites or YouTube channels have done a review on it first. Also, and as we'll discuss in a moment, checking the power supply's cybernetics efficiency rating would be a good way to determine whether or not the unit is a quality unit. One feature you'll run into when choosing a power supply is its efficiency rating. The most common of these are the 80 plus certification program, which has been around since 2004. 
However, Cybernetics is a newer certification program that seeks to take efficiency ratings even further. To understand these rating systems, you first need to understand a little bit of how a computer power supply works. Your computer's components use DC or direct current power. However, the power coming from the outlet that your computer is plugged into delivers AC or alternating current power. Your power supply is responsible for converting the AC power from the wall from your home into the DC power that your components need to operate. During this conversion, there is some loss of power due to heat. So 100% of the AC power drawn from your wall will not get converted into DC power. Lower end power supplies will convert 80% or less of the AC power they draw from the wall into DC power. A really good power supply will convert around 90% or more. So essentially these rating programs tell you how efficient a power supply is at converting AC power into DC power. But it goes a little deeper than that as the rating systems judge a power supply's efficiency when it is under specific loads. In order to earn one of 80 plus programs badges, a power supply must maintain a specific level of efficiency when it is under 10%, 20%, 50%, and 100% load. Here's a table that breaks down each of the different 80 plus ratings and what efficiency level it needs to reach in order to qualify for that specific rating. It's important to note that the 80 plus rating system isn't perfect and doesn't necessarily indicate that a power supply is a quality unit. And therefore the 80 plus program shouldn't be used as the main determining factor in the quality of a power supply. Although it is true that power supplies that achieve the higher spectrum of 80 plus ratings are generally well built in quality units. However, as mentioned earlier, there is also a new PSU certification program. Just like the 80 plus program, Cybernetics seeks to provide consumers with information on how efficient a particular power supply is. However, Cybernetics was started because of inefficiencies they felt existed in the 80 plus program. The main difference between the 80 plus program and the testing carried out by Cybernetics is that where the 80 plus program measures efficiency across four different load levels, Cybernetics tests units across thousands of load levels. Cybernetics also offers a rating specifically for noise levels as well. So if you're looking for a quiet PSU, you can use their rating system to help you choose the right option. Browsing through Cybernetics PSU database will give you an idea of how in-depth their program is. The program also offers a 15 page PDF report for each unit they test that contains all of the results from their testing of that particular unit. The program is a bit newer and so it is not as widely adopted as the 80 plus program, but it is only a matter of time before PSU companies start sharing their cybernetics rating in their marketing materials, either alongside or in place of their 80 plus rating. Some manufacturers are already doing it. The bottom line is that where the 80 plus rating system will overrate some units, the cybernetics rating program likely won't. So before you choose a power supply for your build, it wouldn't be a bad idea to check the cybernetics PSU database to A, get ideas for quality options you can use for your build, or B, to verify the PSU you are considering is an efficient unit. ATX 3.0 is the new standard that seeks to replace the old ATX 2 standard, which has been in place for over 20 years. Among other things, the ATX 3.0 standard seeks to improve the overall efficiency of power supplies, as well as standardize how power supplies connect to graphics cards. Sometime in the future, it is possible that for newer graphics cards, you will be required to use an ATX 3.0 power supply. This means that if you are building a PC right now and you opted for an ATX 2 power supply for your build, that power supply might not be able to accommodate a graphics card upgrade sometime in the future. Of course, it is probably likely that there will be adapters made so that you can still use an ATX 2 power supply with a newer graphics card. But if you're building a PC right now and you want to have the option to upgrade your system in the future, Opting for an ATX 3.0 PSU is probably your best bet. ATX 3.0 power supplies do cost a bit more than their ATX 2 counterparts at the moment though, and so if future proofing is not something you are concerned with, you will be fine to use an ATX 2 power supply. It should be noted though that if you are going to choose a high-end NVIDIA RTX 4000 series card for a new build, it wouldn't be a bad idea to pair it with an ATX 3.0 power supply. Now you don't need to pair a 4000 series card with an ATX 3.0 PSU, but as the new PSUs come with dedicated 12 volt high power connectors with a 3.0 unit, you won't have to use an adapter to connect your PSU to your graphics card. Also, because the new ATX 3.0 standard requires that 3.0 units can handle larger power spikes, getting a 3.0 power supply for your high end 4000 series card will offer you some peace of mind. It's not that ATX 2 units cannot handle such power spikes, but there's no guarantee that they can do it, whereas 3.0 units have to be able to accommodate these spikes 
in order to qualify for being considered as a 3.0 unit. Modularity refers to whether or not you have control over the cables on your power supply. Fully modular power supplies come with none of the cables pre-connected and instead allow you to connect only the cables you need. Semi-modular power supplies come with the most important cables pre-connected, that's the 24-pin motherboard power connector and the CPU power connector, and probably a PCIe connector as well. And then they allow you to connect the remaining cables that you'll need. Non-modular power supplies come with all cables pre-connected, whether you want to use them or not. So for most builders who have no need of multiple SATA power connections or Molex connections, this will leave you with a bunch of leftover cables that will end up connecting to nothing. This group of cables will take up space in your case and look ugly if they can be seen. If possible, we recommend that you use a modular power supply in your build. However, modularity comes with a premium, and if you're working with a budget, you may not have the option to get a modular power supply. Of course, there's nothing technically wrong with using a non-modular PSU. It will just make cable management a bit trickier, and it can hurt the aesthetics of your build. You also need to ensure that the power supply you choose will offer the correct number of connectors for your build. If you're purchasing a power supply based off of your system's needs, you will more than likely get a PSU that will have all of the necessary cables to assemble your system. However, in rare cases, it is possible that a PSU may not offer the correct cables to power the CPU and graphics card you have chosen. Therefore, you need to check the motherboard you are purchasing and see what kind of CPU power connection it requires. Most modern motherboards will require 8-pin connections, but some higher-end options can take dual 8-pin CPU power connections. You can actually run those motherboards with just a single 8-pin CPU power connector, but the additional 8-pin power connector will help deliver the optimal amount of power to your CPU for overclocking, and you probably won't be choosing such a motherboard unless you want to be able to overclock. So if you are choosing a high-end motherboard with dual 8-pin CPU power connectors, it would be a good idea to make sure your power supply provides the appropriate amount of cables and ports to accommodate plugging power into both of those connectors. You'll also need to make sure that your power supply offers enough PCIe connections to accommodate your graphics card. If you're getting a power-hungry GPU like an RX 7900 XTX, you may be required to connect it with as many as three 8-pin PCIe connectors. So you'll not only need to choose a power supply that will offer enough power for the 7900 XTX, but that will also offer enough PCIe power ports and connections to actually connect to it. Also, for high-end NVIDIA RTX 4000 series graphics cards that come with the 12-volt high-power ports, you'll need to make sure the power supply you choose comes with the right 12-volt high-power connector or the correct adapter. The bottom line is before you commit to a specific power supply, be sure to check the cables and ports that it comes with and make sure they will provide you with all of the connection options your build needs. Now that you have a general idea of how to choose a power supply, we're going to walk you through how we chose our power supply for a $1,000 gaming PC build. For starters, with all of our other components selected, we only had about $90 left in our budget to pick a PSU. First, we needed to determine the correct wattage we'd need to power our system. We headed to Outer Vision's power supply calculator. We used the basic version. For CPU, we put in the 5600X. For memory, we put in two 8GB DDR4 modules. For video cards, we selected AMD, then put in our RX 7800 XT. For storage, we put in one M.2 NVMe SSD, and we left optical drives blank since we don't have one. The calculator suggested a minimum PSU wattage of 469 watts. That is considerably less than the 700 watts that AMD recommends to run a 7800 XT. However, since we typically like to add around 200 watts of headroom to the calculator's output just to be safe, the 700 watt recommendation from AMD is actually pretty spot on. So for our build, we'll be looking for a quality unit between 650 to 750 watts. At the time we went to purchase our parts, we first looked at 650 watt units, but noticed that the 750 watt options that were available were typically less than $10 more. So we ended up narrowing down our selection to ADATA's XPG Core Reactor 750 watt unit and Thermaltake 750 watt Tough Power Grand RGB, as they were both about $95. Both units are 80 plus gold rated and come with enough CPU power and PCIe power connections for our build. Both of these units receive Cybernetics gold ratings for efficiency, but the core reactor received an A grade for noise level with an average noise output of 21.19, while the Thermaltake unit received an A minus rating for noise with an average noise output of 29.31. 
So given that both units were the same price and provided about the same efficiency, we opted for the slightly quieter XPG unit. There may have been a better power supply option out there somewhere, but we felt pretty confident that the XPG Core Reactor 750 watt unit was a good enough option to power our build. So with the selection of the XPG Core Reactor, we now had our final part list. We did go over our budget by about $25, but that's the way choosing parts for a PC build goes. It's always tempting to spend just a little more. And considering we only went over by 25 bucks, I think we did pretty good. In the next video, we'll do a full rundown of our build, assemble it, test it in a number of games, and give you the results of our benchmarks. We'll see you there.